Welcome to the Memory Core, episode four, four, four. Adam, you are not going to believe this, but What's guess up? what? What's up? Quicksell personally called me, and we have a sponsorship. You know they're doing a buy one, get one tank deal right now? Oh, man. Does that mean we're actually have enough money to put up a podcast? Yeah, I sure hope like so. <laughs> Quicksell, if you don't want to break the bank, just buy a tank. We'll give you two. <laughs> I thought I'd surprise you with that one. <laughs> I hope this ages well. <laughs> it, um, I, probably not. <laughs> hey, guys. Um... So yeah, we uh, I've been taking some advice from you guys. We were looking for uh, podcasting platforms, and then um, life and overwhelming laziness got in the way. Uh, so we do not yet have a podcast set up, but we'll 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 get there, eventually. Maybe definitely laziness though. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, laziness. Um, so yeah, we will we will do it. We will do it. I promise. We will do it. I just can't promise you when. It'll be ready when it's ready. Yeah, when basically when we figure it out and life doesn't start kicking us in the nuts all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, since we last we last talked, which has actually been a little bit longer than I thought. I think we, were, we thought we were going to do this like what two or three weeks ago, and then it ended up being like, yeah, a little bit longer. But hey, it's January, so we're still good. Um, we kind of wanted to update you guys on some of the art. Um, you know, we were talking about art last time, and so sort of the things that uh, concerned us. And, uh, you know, since then, you know, we had the Ost Soul revealed and we had a uh, couple other stuff that came out. And I think a lot of our main points still kind of stood. Yeah, I sure, I, sure feel, bleh, I sure feel like that. Yeah, I think one of the big things was just, um, you know, Dan had mentioned, and I think he used a really good term, was the genericness of some of the designs. And not... Well, they... Not just yeah. the genericness, but all of it kind of blends together. You're, yeah. We're kind of losing the... Individuality. Yeah, individuality, and we're losing... Because what people don't understand is there's multiple manufacturers in this universe. Mm -hmm. you know, at least new people getting into the game. So you're kind of missing out on... I don't know, like if you see a difference between like what are two popular, like GM and... You know, Ostman yeah. Industries. Yeah, I, I think the, the big thing was um, with the Ost Soul is that the original Ost Soul had a very humanoid face uh, to the cockpit, whereas the Ost Rock had sort of a circular cyclopean eye. And then in this new Ost Soul that Scroggins, you know, put out as as a, a, a proposal had the Ost's soul weapons and layout and the actual body shape was actually pretty good and i have no problem with the body shape it's a little bit beefier than the original Ost was but that's okay because the original Ost's were actually based off of the uh, the walker pods from robotech and so it had a very alien appearance and what faucet is they just put arms on it um and then put a head so with this Ost soul it had it had a, a really nice proportions really nice body shape but the head the cockpit shape Rather than being a sort of anthropo anthropoid face, had the Ostrock Cyclopean eye. And the question is, well, then what the hell does the Ostrock look like? If it already has this major calling to, I mean, what's going to happen? What's, what's the Ostrock going to be looking like? And yeah. one of my other concerns was um, the same sort of cockpit glass panels, the, the way the glass was framed looked very similar to what was already on the Orion and the Longbow and to a lesser extent the Behemoth. And I had mentioned that to Scroggins and I think he 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 sort of agreed with me a little bit. And he, I mean to be fair, like he is making like a hundred of these things. Like it's hard not to let your tendencies and what you do creep into them. But I was like, ah, you know, because I was telling you, Dan, that in the old art, I mean, for a long, long time. I mean, for better or for worse. Because, I mean, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll cop to it. You know, the 3058 Night Star is kind of goofy looking. The miniature is kind of goofy looking. It kind of looks like a bent-over Mickey Mouse with its big freaking <laughs> gloved hands. Um, but you could do a tight close-up on any battle mech on the face. And you would be able to know which one that is, whether it was an archer or a marauder. An Orion, a Battlemaster, a Charger, an Atlas, a Banshee, a Firestarter, and everything. They were all different. Not so much now. 
Not so much now. That's a, that's a concern. Like, are we losing some individuality because we're afraid of it, you know, quote unquote, looking goofy? I looking... like I like the ass until you pointed that out to me, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's just sort of like, oh, damn. I was so happy with it until, you know, ah. Um, and I think that's that's one of the things. Like, even, even like the Valkyrie and the Phoenix Hawk and the original Unseen Art, granted, because they were all based off of the Veritech fighters from Robotech, um, they looked very similar. But even then, like you could look at the Phoenix Hawk, the Wasp, and the Valkyrie, depending on how the Phoenix Hawk's head was drawn, depending on you know what book you were looking at, because um, that did vary quite a bit. But you could look at particularly the Valkyrie and the Wasp, and even though they're very similar, they still look different enough. Like the Valkyrie had sharp edges to it that made it look like almost like it had the proboscis of a wasp, or like like an actual wasp or a bug or an insect, and like the wasp. Battle mech had more of a, a round ovoid shape, whereas the Stinger had more of the you know the boxy TV, you know cockpit, yeah. um, and that's a, that's a concern. Like, are we losing this individuality? And I think you could really see it in the Fire Moth, like this sort of resistance to wanting to see these upwards, reverse canted arms, and all he does is just bring him down close and tight to the body to like the point where they're actually non-functional. Yeah. Now, now they can't you know swerve side to side. They can't. It, it's just. Even the skirt in the back is gone. Right. They put, right. Like, we'll replace the skirt with with two tubes that run down the back. Like, that's any better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's like this is like this resistance. It's almost like... It, I guess the, the way I see it is this, is that I, I'm not a big fan of, of pop music, but no longer being a, a moody, pissy teenager... I can hear pop music and I can kind of look at it maybe a bit academically because I, I do play a musical instrument and I can recognize where, where things are difficult to do or there's like really cool harmonization. Um, if you guys haven't followed him or, or seen any of his videos on YouTube, there's a, a bass player named Adam Neely who's done a lot of like really cool things. He's got like a lot of really cool educational videos and he's done a number of reharmonizations of pop songs. Like he's got one like Adele's Hello that is like, fucking smoking man like it just layers core changes on core changes and core changes and so what he's done is instead of like tossing what's been done because it's quote unquote goofy he's sort of embraced it and leaned into it and found ways to make it work yeah or even to accentuate what's weird to lean into it um and i think it's almost like a lesson that can be taken you know, lean into it and see what you can get. That's Enhance, weird. don't improve. Yeah, like look at, yeah, because, you know, is it is it going to look, like I said, is it, is it going to be in, you know, in 10 years, or is it going to be like, oh, you know, we should have done this, or we should have... Well, I know, mean, there's there's it. beauty and simplicity. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's one of those things, like, yeah, the genericness. Yeah. Like you were, like, like you were saying, Dan. Yeah. I, mean, I know you're just, a Firemouth fan. Yeah, I know. You ruined that for me, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm good at what I'm, I'm good at what I'm good at, um, and it, it's it's again you know Scroggins is a, is a better illustrator than I'll ever be. Um, he has a very good innate talent. I just you know or some of the decisions you know they're going to come back to haunt us because I think even he released a new updated Orion recently that I think they had a poll for which cockpit that or not necessarily a poll but he was looking for input to see which cockpit the community liked better. Yeah, well, and they all like the the newer one. And then, of course, you know, more of the old school guys like the older one, because the older one, you know, helped define the Orion. And it kind of matched actually closer to the, the new sculpt Orion that came out a couple of years ago. That's actually been well received by the community. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the, the, the higher ups at, at Catalyst said, no, you really got to you really got to kind of evoke more of the older style art. And I don't know if I make I make no pretensions to be like, oh, yeah, like the guys at Catalyst read my comment. and They're like, oh, he's totally right. Yeah, <laughs> we need we need to name our firstborn children after him. Yeah, it's like they're not they're not doing that. But I think it's please, it's, please don't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he already has enough of an ego. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think I think I think they're probably kind of all thinking the same thing, right? I mean, they're all thinking the same thing. So I do have an ego. <laughs> I didn't mean in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it just sort of one of those things, like. Um, you know, because the things that are Scroggins are doing, they're kind of showing up more and more. That sort of like touches by him. It's like you know, it's something that he's done because he has his own style. Um, and uh, I was thinking about this. Like, there are some. Uh, there's a sax player um, who's 
I don't know if I call it famous, but I mean, he's quite successful. He does have a, a pretty big following and he's been in a couple of zoo, a uh, couple of, of bands out of New York, one called too many zoos and one called lucky chops. And he, he plays more of a sort of a, a dance groove style on a saxophone and he plays a very sax and he's, 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 he's awesome. Like he does a lot of really, really cool, really difficult things on the sax that are just like glissandos, glissandos on a keyed instrument, not like, it's almost like a slide, like a trombone slide. And to do that with a keyed instrument is not easy stuff. Um, but he can do it. And um, he's a phenomenal player. But when he gets to his solos, he has these things that he does. It's kind of like, yeah, this is me. And it gets kind of repetitive. And it's one of those things like, he's great. But he's repetitive in a way that's like John Coltrane and other classical saxophone players. Not classical, but like classic jazz players. Did not do. Um, and so it's kind of one of those things I see that with Scroggins. And it's funny, you know, I, I just read uh, a history of the saxophone, being a saxophone player myself. And uh, it's really cool because you see the sort of differences between jazz players and classical players. You know, jazz players seem to be very warm and friendly, like the successful ones. Like there was anecdotes about Charlie Parker, like, you know, making sure all his bandmates are, are eating and like helping out young players. And like, there's a really sweet anecdote of him sort of coaching Phil Woods, who would also become this really famous alto saxophone player. And he passed away about, you know, four and a half years ago. Um, and you contrast that with classical saxophone players. And they're not all like this, but some of the big ones like Marcel Mule and Sigurd Rascher, the sort of founders of the French and German school of, of classical playing. And again, like both phenomenal players, but they did not get along it, the way they were talked about, it's almost like they never experienced any joy in life. They were absolutely miserable fucking people to spend any time with, like totally insufferable, you know, not warm or gracious or like eager to teach. Like they were eager to teach because they did it, but like they did, it's like, they seemed like they were very overbearing and just torturous to their students. Sounds like a really good time. Yeah, yeah. And it's just one of those things like they just... If you ever read an interview with Alan Moore, the comic book writer Alan Moore, like he just, it just sounds like just spending any time with this person and he's like, just take me to the dentist and just like pull my teeth. <laughs> and it's just, just, just insufferable to be around. Speaking of insufferable. Oh no. <laughs> Get the unsubscribe buttons ready guys, cause we're going for a ride. <laughs> Today's gonna be probably part one of who knows how many about our opinions on the clans. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so yeah, well, I, don't know I know, I know Dan, you're more of a, you're more of a clan fan than I am. Yeah, a, a little bit more. And it's mostly because of my introduction into the game. I was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my introduction to the game was the cartoon. And so the clans were like this really phenomenal antagonist. Um, but you were, you were, it was you, MechWarrior 2, right? Oh yeah, MechWarrior 2. So my, the way I looked at the, the universe PC is game. a lot yeah. different. Yeah, the PC game, the right? P, yeah, yeah, PC yeah. game, not, not MechWarrior 2nd Edition. Yeah, yeah. But, um, well, I, know, I mean, because I mean, one of the things we want to talk about was sort of our, our perspective of the game. Um, kind of like the, the start of the clans and not, not so much like, chronologically in universe sort of chronologically in development and then maybe we'll do it this podcast maybe the next one sort of our problems with how the clan introduction changed the board game and then sort of things that I mean at least irritate me about their culture um, and how it kind of works in sort of the meta of the universe um so yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if, I mean, what was, what, your first introduction to the clans was, was MechWarrior 2, but what was your first introduction to the clans or how you sort of absorbed them in the context of the game itself? So in the game, uh, I, I started obviously a fourth edition. I mentioned that a lot. Mm -hmm. And when we started, or we got a gaming group together, we were playing a lot of you know, MechWarrior 2. And then I think around the time we got into it, it was also MechWarrior 4, which is, where everything kind of mixes together. Yeah. Is you had, like, Clan Tech wasn't necessarily in its own bracket. Yeah. Uh, it was, like, kind of the improvement 
of the inner sphere technology that you started with. Yeah. So that's how we chose to play a lot of our games. So a lot of the first playing experiences I had with Battletech the board game were using clan technology and custom Omnimex and things like that. Mm. I mean, just to give you an idea, my friend Drew at the time, his big thing was a Warhawk and he basically made it a hundred tons and had enough heat sinks to fire every single PPC at once. Even dabbled in, God, what was the name of the designers back then? There was Battle Mech Designer. There was, well, I, whatever the other one was, I think it was like Mech Engineer. They had rotary auto cannons in it. <laughs> and he had a rotary auto cannon 10 on one of his variants. Cause right, because we were, we were sort of getting, we probably kind of got the internet at the same time. Yeah, you know, sort of right, right after sort of the, the Foster was releasing the field manuals. He got all this like sick new technology, like the rotary auto cannons and the gauze rifles. Um, and, you know, Max that could come out. And yeah, so we're probably. Yeah, because Mech Force UK actually had clan rotary auto cannons. Not a lot of people remember that, oh, but man. they did, and that's what he used. And our our games were basically formed around like Clan Jade Falcon, because that was his favorite clan. Mm -hmm. And we did a like Falcon versus Wolf, binary versus trinary, which we gave the trinary stock clan mechs. And the binary, we had our different commanders with their own like home variants. Mm -hmm. Mine wasn't as bad. I had a Shadow Cat. I didn't play with like the armor or anything. But mine was kind of close to like a Phoenix Hawk. So okay. I had like an ER large laser, I think three medium pulse lasers, and a Streak SRM6. That's pretty solid. That's 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 pretty nasty. Yeah, because yeah. I, I tried to do things that were kind of, like it was kind of munchy, but it was yeah. a little more geared towards how yeah. variants looked in the universe. Yeah. Like yeah. even my brother, when he played with us, he had a Cauldron Born and he was playing with heavy lasers. So he had like two heavy large lasers, like. I think like an LRM 15 or 20, mm -hmm. uh, like a Streak SRM 6. It's like even his were kind of geared that way. Yeah. But, or like my friend Alan had a Turkina that had, it lobbed probably over 100 LRMs. <laughs> like he just, he had an obsession with LRMs. And well, and clan other. LRMs, right? Like, like the best freaking yeah, weapon in the Yeah, I know. Game. I just, I we'll saw get, the, We'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to that. I, I saw the look on your face change. Like, oh, that mother. <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So that, that that's basically what our games were. And the, I started getting a little more munchy, too. Like, I, I took a penetrator and I put, like, clan pulse lasers and stuff on it and beefed yeah. it, like, 80 tons. And we were playing with, like, uh, at the time... Um, like compact gyros and like hardened armor and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So w when I started getting sick of that, and Alan, who you know, my friend Alan, uh, who's played with us in our recent campaigns, he got sick of it too. Yeah. And we were like, hey, you know what we should do? We should try doing a like 30, 25 era. We could do like our own. This is like a suggestion for me. We could, you know, kind of play like like how the fluff works in the game. Like we could be scavengers and go mm -hmm. from, you know, star system to star system, mm -hmm. like a, a full blown campaign. And that was it, group over. <laughs> oh man, that sucks. You know, I, um, you know, for me, it was the, the cartoon. And then my friend found, and I think I told you this before, and I think I've told you the audience this before. But oh yeah, we're, we're probably gonna be repetitive with yeah, this. So, I mean, just as a refresher, you know, my friend had found the City Tech second edition box set at the local hobby store, and then I found third edition Battletech at the local hobby store. And you know, for him, like the the power of those weapons, because my my friend at the time, I mean, and he still kind of still kind of is, and I haven't I haven't really seen him for a long time. Although I did run into him in the grocery store last week out of nowhere, um, which was actually nice to see him briefly, but um, really like like munchy to the max. Um, and then when he wasn't being munchy, he was like playing with sort of newish gear just because like, uh, this was years ago, I was, I was back from vet school for a little bit and we got together to play a game and rather than like actually like coming up with a force with which to play the game and to actually play a fair fight and competitively, you know, I had taken my Lance of Max that we had thought we were taking with a set battle value. And he took like two custom designs with a bunch of rocket launchers because of like Ooh. reasons. And I totally fucking blew out of the water because of course, 
Of course, like, he fired all his rocket launchers at once. And missed. Because we used group firing rules. <laughs> and shut down. And I was like... I will say... Why? Just, I know, I know, like... And, and, and rocket launchers can actually be pretty powerful. They are my guilty pleasure. But it's just sort of like, okay, like, here we we're going to play, like, an actual match. And you took a bunch of one-shot weapons. It's, it's definitely a fluff weapon. And you fucking missed? And now it's done? I haven't played a game in like two years. This is it? Yeah. So yeah, that 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 sums up. Like, my my friend is the guy who would take the dire wolf. Prime. Corner my rifle man. Group firing rolls again. Alpha strike. Miss with everything. Oh. Shut down. Thankfully, not blow his ammo up. But shut down. At which point I would just like kick the mech and it'd fall over and then just this 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 would be my experience with playing with my friend and it's like okay this this is this oh, is not man. rewarding <laughs> i feel i almost feel like i'm we're having some kind of like like i'm your psychiatrist right now yeah yeah you're you're laying on the couch talking about this right i wonder well, why you're so bitter well you know it's it's like you <laughs> you part of the part of playing battle tech is is the the universe that's i think it's what drew everyone in and it's and talk about and we'll get to it too it's in the beginning of shrapnel um, which was an anthology series. I think it was produced in 88 or 89. And Jordan Wiseman has, a, has an introductory essay about the universe. One of the things that drew people in was sort of the, the universe setting itself, the scavenger setting, um, and the sort of the royalty, the sort of neo-feudalism, and what it means to own a battle mech and, and exploring those vistas that Battletech presented. And I couldn't explore those vistas with my friend because he wanted to just be like, a clan player who maxed out his Omni Mac and would just either like steamroll you because it was clan tech or um, alpha strike and shut down. It gets old after a while, doesn't it? It does. It does. <laughs> um, there wasn't much of that sort of that careful, considerate gameplay that you're riding. You're riding the, the the bell curve of the dice, right? You're riding that curve and taking those risks, but you know strategy still does play a role. And the dice provide enough of a randomness that your, your well-aid strategy can fall apart. Or you could be at the receiving end of that strategy, you could be biting your nails because you know like it just takes that one hit to your torso to, to cause that ammunition explosion because the armor stripped off. And like somehow you survive. And it's such a thrill ride. Um, but you, 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 don't, you don't experience that with the wrong players. You, know, you really don't see that. No, um, you don't. You, um, don't. you don't have to breach your own mech when you fall in <laughs> a death one water hex yeah do you want to tell that story or should i tell that story <laughs> you you can tell it so we were uh, we were playing as a commando yeah we were playing a scenario um is out of the kel hounds book and uh, i mean it was really written to, to really be a fair fight but for a while there like dan dan was playing the direct bonus combine and i was playing the kel hounds and it's a total total numbers mismatch with the kel hounds players have such a higher skill role and uh Dan had you had the commando right, mm -hmm. and it just like Dan's dice were just hot, like cockpit hits and pilot knockouts and just just giving me a really hard time. And then about halfway through, I think things turn. I think in the end, you still won the scenario, but I think the most the most brilliant moment was um, I had knocked down his. Was it a stinger you were in, or was it commando? I. Actually, I did it to myself. Yeah, yeah. I jumped. I took a risk and jumped. I forgot why. There, there was an actual reason to it. Yeah, I don't know if it was like a gyro hit, like, or if it was... No, it, it, he didn't have a gyro hit or anything. It, it was something. Like, it was starting to get risky to keep him where he was. I, I forget how, because it was like, what, a year something, ago? Something forced this? you to do a pilot and skill roll. Yeah, it was the jump into the water hex. Yeah. <laughs> and... You fell, right? I fell and failed that, and I had to do a breaching roll. And Which you it, did not know about. I did not know. So and in, in all fairness, in your in the introductory box set, which is where I played most of my games, there are no breaching roles. Oh, okay. okay. There are none listed in but there. But it's 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 in Total Warfare, and uh, essentially, if you take because you you fell right, you fell, yes. and I can't remember what section you landed on. It, it was one of my torsos. Yeah, but it didn't it didn't penetrate. It wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't blow past the armor, the falling damage, but... That water sure did. Yeah, anytime you take a hit <laughs> underwater to a location that's underwater, even if it doesn't penetrate the armor, you have to do a roll for a potential breaching hit. 
is in that whole section then becomes flooded with water. And Dan had no idea. He's like, you're full of shit. What are you talking about? Well, I, never... I knew about breaching and the way but I you... was used to it was if you had no more armor on that location, you yeah, land yeah, in water, yeah. it's gone. Yeah, yeah. So Dan was like, I gotta look this up. So we looked it up. And it's it's like it's like a high roll too. So it's like the rules are like what like a ten or above. Yeah, it breaches. And My hot dice betrayed me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then like, the whole section <laughs> flooded. Oh, it was brilliant. I think I was laughing for like five minutes after that. <laughs> it was pretty good. I was like, man, the one time I want to be a rules lawyer, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it worked out for me. Yeah. But you know the the cool thing is like when we game with each other, like it's not rules lawyering in a sense where we're trying to like out outdo each other it's more like really because i don't freaking remember that yeah 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 it's, it's just it's just fun stuff like that that you don't really experience in other games that BattleTech has um but we want to kind of kind of back up here for a second i think i think one of the, the big things and what i would love to see uh maybe maybe it's a bit self-indulgent to think of this but yeah i mean you know there, there are people out there you know who are sort of um you know academics who look back and they'll write books on the history of something they'll write a book on the history of you know jack kirby or on the history of you know a musician or something like that and i think you know battletech has had enough words printed for the game and i think has had enough of an impact on people that i think it really would be interesting to see sort of a an inside or academic look on the development of the game well, when, when everybody talks about the history of battletech they always like to look inside of the game right they don't necessarily look at the outside right and right. what kind of got us into this was following the the charrette collection because that's yeah. what reminded us about the shrapnel yeah yeah the yeah whole entry in it yeah he actually posted about it and yeah so our, was, what's the guy's name it was, it was uh do you, do you have the copy of the book or, or shrapnel or no no i actually do not have shrapnel. So, um but yeah i, I have it i, sh I should brought it but there's, there's a guy so jordan wiseman he came up with the idea of it because he was back in 84 i think he was at some convention and saw a bunch of the models for uh macross not robotech macross slight difference that's just me splitting hairs but macross and uh doug ram and uh i mean doug ram was pretty cool because it had this very sort of down-to-earth um gritty you know, military feel. Um, and Robotech had more of the super robots. But even Doug Ram had more of a, a super robot thing. Like, the Doug Ram, which what we would know as a Shadowhawk, um, still had, uh, you know, abilities and capabilities, you know, well beyond um, the other forces mechs. And so the Doug Ram could just, you know, wreck everybody. And that's a very, it's a very Japanese concept. And so a lot of times the the... The plots of, of Japanese anime seems to be more um, character driven rather than plot driven. Like you have to achieve this thing, you know, because of X reason. And then your your characters, this character's sort of pros and cons kind of help or get in the way of that. And how its interactions with the plot are interesting. Whereas in more of the Japanese thing, it's like the underarching plot is more of a, a a side story and a vehicle to see these more character driven stories and. You know, I think here's another thing that's probably cost people to unsubscribe. Um, I am not a big fan of Neon Genesis Evangelion. I know it's a really renowned and beloved anime. It's okay. I tried and I could not. Yeah, get into I it. can't. I can't. I can't really. I, I can't give it another pass. I can't give it another watch because it's just it's so frustrating. It's like the whole time it's just like Shinji. You depressed motherfucker. Just get in the fucking robot and save the goddamn world. <laughs> Stop being Kai. <laughs> take take some fucking Zoloft and get the job done. Which is maybe not a healthy attitude. It's very much like in the veterinary world. That sort of thing. Like, oh man, I, I fucking hate this dog, but I gotta do this. And like, he's trying to bite me and just have to have to do it. Um, just gotta push through no matter how tired I am because this dog needs me. Um, I really don't want to drill this Mosler safe. There's Ralsom in it. Yeah. yeah. But they're... They have a contract. Yeah. Oh man, I got to do this. <laughs> so that, that's that's kind of what Jordan Wiseman was saying. Was he didn't he to him from his Western perspective, he didn't really like a lot of the plots and stories of of uh, Japanese anime. Um, and I I, I definitely uh, agree with that. I mean, there are some animes I really do enjoy and I really do like, but you know, in general, like yeah, like I, I you know, from my Western eye, I kind of want to see a different type of story. He was looking for a more like tech storied approach. Yeah. Well, the other thing too is, you know, obviously all these battle maps are 
kind of relatively equal in capability. You know, a point of armor in a locus is the same as a point of armor on an atlas. I mean, the atlas has more armor, but it's not like you know, a locus is going to run through and just like destroy everything with its medium laser, like it would in like a, an anime. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> one shot a marauder. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, they just like like Goku and Dragon Ball. You know, he just digs a little deeper. Yeah, and he does it. You know, it's I'm like, gonna stand with my arms up. That spirit bomb is gonna last five episodes, and yeah. I could take a beating, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah. gonna happen. Because it's just sort of that thing, like, oh, if you just if you just dig a little deeper, you try a little harder. Inuyasha, we're, we're, we're all Kagome, here. Inuyasha, Kagome. I'm so, more, I'm more of a Yamcha. Yeah, I, I <laughs> we, we, we were there. We said where we were. You know, like with you know, we were there. You know, for like Adult Swim. Like at the start, and a lot of the, the animes that were presented on there, like you know, we've we've seen at least a couple episodes of them, and it's just like, uh, I, I know they're not all like that. I know there's definitely a lot of Battle Tiger was more of the cowboy bebop of all of them, like yeah, kind of standing yeah. out, you know, because it well, actually has a theme. Well, you know, and the thing too, you know, kind of bummed me about cowboy bebop. It started off like it had all these like kick-ass jazz songs and like these sort of really cool action scenes, and then it kind of gave way to something else, which um, is not maybe not fair. I should probably give it another listen to again, but it seemed like the the punch and energy of the first couple episodes of Cowboy Bebop seemed to very quickly leave the series. Um, the, it was the theme of the whole show that kept me gripped. Yeah, because they yeah. they did hold on to the theme for the yeah. whole the whole series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I probably should give it another listen to or another another watch. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, um, kind of circling back again um, in, in that opening of 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 Shrapnel. What was the guy's name? Damn. I can't. So yeah, if I had the was book. It Perkins, Parkins, um, he was the one that kind of came up with a lot of the backstory based off of. I'm, I'm gonna look up that that uh, Shrek collection and see what that says. So we're gonna keep talking, but um, Wiseman kind of came up with the the main setting, and then this other guy kind of came up with the the backstory. And to kind of come up with the to clans, I was I was looking at. Um, Sort of the the series of mentions of in the early fiction and see kind of when the idea of the clans was starting to crystallize and how it was being um, formed. Yeah, it, we were after seeing that post. You go Pat Larkin. Pat Larkin. Pat Larkin's his okay. name. Yeah, because we we're kind of like I wonder where it started to become obvious when the clans were going to start approaching. Like, when did you really get this idea that some like this the gathering storm yeah you know? yeah and if people want a nice nice reference by the way i know um <laughs> if people want to sort of comment you know down below in the comment section just tell us you know when were you there at the time like did you see it coming because i missed out on it yeah we kind of came into it after the fact yeah um but okay so when you look at the the initial publications you, you had the battle droids box set which was battletech first edition and battletech second edition had this same kind of layout but it, Essentially, there was a brief, like, you know, three or four paragraph entry into sort of providing the, the background for what Battletech was. And there was, you know, the mention of the Star League, sort of this era of perpetual war. Hanson's Rough Riders was in there, yeah, too. Yeah, the scavenger mentality of the setting. Um, but in that was a mention of Wolf's Dragoons. And it, it did say you know, they were well equipped. There was rumored to be a base outside the successor states where they got all their gear. Um, and uh, the Star League was referenced in that intro paragraph, but there wasn't much more than that. You know, the, so it's cool. Like the Wolf Dragoons were mentioned initially with this base outside the the successor it's a, states. It's a nice little entry that makes you go, "Huh, that's kind of weird." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and um, you know, it's the same paragraph that's in second edition and third edition. They just they just lifted that and just plop that back in for the setting. Um, and then in 1985. Uh, with after BattleTech Second Edition, we've got the Tales of the Black Widow Company with Natasha Kerensky, which is where she's first mentioned, she, right? And you know, they talk about Wolf Dragoons, they talk about sort of the history of Wolf Dragoons in the Inner Sphere, but not really anything before that, or you know, a lot of a lot of nitty gritty. And there wasn't any mention of like a Star League in that book, as far as I could tell, um, flipping through it. But you see Natasha Kerensky, so that's neat. And I think it, one. In many ways, it was a bit progressive of Battletech to have, you know, a main character or a featured character that was actually female, which was mm -hmm. cool. And she's very capable as a mech warrior, and she's she's referenced as, as being, you know, a badass. Definitely looks a lot like Sigourney Weaver. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, it, that. and you know, all props to that, that kick ass Jim Holloway art on the front oh, cover. Yeah. Whether it is the you topless know, version. You didn't know it was the right, topless right, 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 right. Yeah. And I saw that, and then it was in the Shrek collection. They posted it. And I was like, man, that's. You're like, that's not true. I was like, no, it is. I've seen it. It's and, out there. And she looks. I mean, it's one of those things like, yeah, she looks pretty good. Um, so that's, that's <laughs> a bit of the male side of me coming out. But, um, but yeah, no, so it's, it's cool. So we're, we're seeing that. And. Uh, I, I love Jim Holloway's art, like both that and uh, the Fox's Teeth cover art, and I, I love the uh, the design of the infantryman on the cover of the Fox's Teeth, because it just has this the futuristic helmet design with these like really neat curves to the the, the glass panels in the helmet and the equipment. It's it's really cool, um, and I, I hope that gets referenced elsewhere. Um, with any new art that comes out, because just stuff if, like that looks really cool. I wonder if he was inspired by Mobius. I'm sure he was. I'm sure those it, guys it were. Sure, yeah. it looks similar. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just something like that's just really cool, and, and seeing that. Um, but anyway, so in the Fox's teeth, you have a mention of the Kerensky Protectorate. I think, and this would be in reference to his regency with Richard Cameron, um, Alexander Kerensky. But it's not. It's not actually. They don't mention Alexander Kerensky. They do mention Stefan Ameris. They only mention Kerensky. So my only assumption is that, yeah, this is Alexander Kerensky. Now, if you're astute, right, you're probably looking, if you have both books, you're probably like, huh, the Kerensky Protectorate and Natasha Kerensky. Like, These are separated by hundreds of years, but like, yeah, Kerensky's how did that lineage. It's, last not, it's, not exactly, it's not exactly like a Smith last name, right? Like, where this Kerensky name's got to mean something, right? And so I think this is when you're starting to see they must be sort of tying things together. Yeah, I think you had the Star League book before. The um, well, the, the two we were after, like Fox's Teeth and that, right? The, the the Star League source book, yeah, that was I think eighty eight. It was eighty eight. Okay. Yeah, so we still got we still got a while before this stuff comes out. Okay, I I was just curious to see if like we knew about Kerensky before Natasha or after her. I think it's, it's after. Okay, it's after. Um, and so then you get to eighty six. Now eighty six was a really good year for BattleTech, um, because you get the second edition. Um, you get. Uh, no, sorry, second edition was 85. But you get... Um, you have scenario books. You have scenario books. The the really interesting thing is is that um, TRO 3025 comes out by a skew number, comes out after MechWarrior First Edition. So MechWarrior First Edition, you've got um, some really cool charts that have like random encounter tables for like battle mech lances. Mm -hmm. And it's got the core mechs from Battletech box set and it has the kind of referenced house battle max in the back of of mech warrior first edition so like the dragon and panther for krita vindicator for lao enforcer valkyrie for davian hermes 2 for the free world's league and the zeus and commando for the lyran commonwealth so those are included in, in those those random encounter tables um but the artwork is actually the loose artwork from thro 3025 so you can tell like, they're working on things at the same time. They, they, I don't know like how they plan things up. They're working on books at the same time. It's almost like they were foreshadowing the arrival of their big technical readout. Right, right. Um, so they must just pull the artwork from that, and then 3025 comes out later. But it's in MechWarrior First Edition in the appendices at the back of the book that really lays out the story and history of the Battletech universe. And so you've got really the, the, the really first mention of Alexander Kerensky, as in Alexander Kerensky, not just the Kerensky Protectorate, but Kerensky by name, and the Exodus, and the Fall of the Star League, and the Rise of Comstar. Um, so that's when you get those things. And so I think at this point, hopefully you're putting things together, right? And you're saying, oh, Natasha Kerensky, Wolf's Dragoons have this base, a uh, presumed base outside the successor states. They have this well-equipped mercenary force. You have this person with this last name, that's only been referenced somewhere else, and the Star League and the Exodus, so the Star League military. So at this point, you're probably hopefully putting things together and you're seeing where it's going. And then 86, you get the release of TRL 325. Um, and then in 87 throughout 89, you've got a lot of this stuff for- um, Your house the, books. The house books, the Fourth Succession War. Um, you've got um, the release of the Wolves on the Border novel by Robert Charette in 89. And granted, they don't mention the clans, they don't mention where the Wolf Dragoons came from, but you can tell, like, the way they, they talk and the way their, um, 
their lingo is in the Wolf Strike games. You can tell that they're different. They're they're different. Um, and then you got the Wolf Strike source sourcebook, which goes in a lot of detail about like their runs to their secret base outside the Inner Sphere, the Anton Merrick Civil War, um, a lot of a lot of kind of things that, are, that are, are are leading somewhere. And it, so I'm wondering, like again, like. At the time, because there weren't web fora. I mean, maybe there were like there, there wouldn't. There wasn't even really the no. internet. So there wasn't. There wasn't even it, like like yeah. mail, like email chains, and uh, chat letters and stuff like that. So there were phone calls. Yeah. So among the yeah phone calls. Wow. Um, so among <laughs> the community, like where people like when they go to conventions, they're like, oh man, you think you think we're gonna see you know the return of the uh, the SLDF and that kind of stuff. And then in 1989, you had the 20 year update and TRO 2750. And so I'm just sort of wondering, like, oh, man, you know, is this, like, where people see, like, 20-year update goes to, up to the year 3049. Um, and I think just the start of the year 3050, because I believe the clan invasion starts, like, what, May of 3050? No. Because there were, it's, there were, there were, it, it, it's the towards, periphery, because it, because it's talking about the 20-year update, how. The, fir the first time they witnessed them was the Calhouns on the Rock, wasn't right, it? Right, right. Yeah. So we know in, in the 20-year update, they talk about losing contact with the bandit kingdoms so the bandit kingdoms were part of the core word periphery which were if you look at a map so the, the 12 o'clock region of yeah like right right above the free rasa hog republic free rasa republic Lyran commonwealth and draconis combine um so those those guys they lose contact with them and the Kelhounds were on the rock there i think chasing after red jack ryan uh and his his band of thieves um but you know it's pretty clear that Things are heading somewhere big. Um, and so the, the Wolves on the Border show you out. Interesting, unique dialogue. Unity, exclamations of unity is sort of like a... You know, like in French, they've got this saying like Zotelors, um, kind of that thing. Um, it's not really a swear, but it could be a swear. It's just sort of this exclamation of frustration. Yeah, like an oorah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it's in September 1989 when Lethal Heritage is published, the first book of the... Uh, the Blood of Kerensky trilogy by Michael Stackpole. The Kelhounds. Yeah. And then in 1990, we get TRO 3050. We get Blood Legacy in um, December 1990, which I believe is when the Wolf's Dragoons did their big reveal to the leaders of the successor states, telling them, hey, you know, in the universe, hey, you know, all those things you were thinking about us, they yep. were right. <laughs> um, and then in uh, September 91 is when we get Lost Destiny. Now, I'm able to give you guys months for when the novels came out because I think the the months are actually included in the novels um, themselves. Like in the beginning, like the first like a couple pages, they'll tell you when it was published. Um, and a lot of this line out I got from Sarna. So Sarna has a list of BattleTech publications and then a list of BattleTech novels in the order they were published. Um, you could basically follow what we were talking about on Sarna.net. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ali, uh, more tales of the Black Widow was published in 90, 1990, um, which had a lot of information in terms of um, what the Wolf Dragoons were doing in the interregnum years between um, 3028 and 3039, and then 3039 to the clan invasion. And if you follow it, it's got stuff when Natasha Kerensky leaves the Wolf Dragoons and joins up with Clan Wolf, um, goes through her trials again, kicks a bunch of ass, you know, forms her you know, new cluster of warriors and then like the hunt for uh, Ragnar Magnuson on Razzlehog and her sort of taking Patrick Kell, not Patrick Kell, Felon Kell under yeah, her Felon. wing um, and all that kind of stuff. And when she becomes um, Khan of Clan Wolf. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so I just wonder, you know, like here on the line out, it seems obvious in retrospect, like, oh, this was obviously building towards something. And you know, even then, if you read the novels, particularly, um, you can see um, even the Comstar stuff is built in towards something. That's a whole other thing. That's a whole yeah, other podcast. Yeah, Com Comstar is its own, yeah. <laughs> its own but thing. But you can see Comstar's sort of <laughs> shitty dealings, I think, at least as early as um, the last novel in the Great If Legion trilogy um, and what they were doing. And then, you know, in retrospect, the Anton Merrick Civil War. Um, there's also the uh, Spider and the Wolf uh, graphic novel, which... Have you read that yet, Dan? No, no. Okay, I'll, I'll let you borrow my copy, if I can, or if I can find a PDF or something. I like think that. I have it. You have it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's 
even by comic book standards in the 1980s, it's not that good. You know, that's not to, to, to knock on the people who worked on it. Um, but it's just, it's not that good. Like the art is confusing. The layout's confusing. The layout of the speech bubbles is not that great. Um, you can also tell that they were leaning heavily. I mean, this is one of the reasons why Battletech, even with the legal troubles that came with the whole classics and the, the sort of release of all these designs, like it needed that. It needed these mechs because they were in everything, everything, um, up to TRL 3025 and even beyond, like they were everywhere. And, in, um, in the, the spider and the wolf graphic novel, um, almost every mech was one of those designs. Um, but in there is, uh, they talk a little bit more of the, the wolf's dragoons and there's a section with, um, Vesser Christopher, the Comstar agent that was kind of manipulating Anton Merrick, try and push the wolf's dragoons into doing their supply run so Comstar could follow them and see where they were coming from. Um, but it, despite how bad it is, I mean, it, it, there were some interesting things in there that, that would become canon. I mean, it was sort of our exposure to uh, Jamie Wolf's brother, Joshua Wolf, who was killed by Anton Merrick and her, his relationship with yeah. Natasha Kerensky and where she gained the moniker, the Black Widow. Um, there's also a really interesting uber 1980s illustration of General Alexander Kerensky <laughs> with uh, a full head of hair and an eye patch. <laughs> And a very sort of like... Which, yeah, that was the first picture of him, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think by, uh, chronologically, in terms of publication, that was his first picture. Um, and he's got this like really cool uniform. It's sort of... I don't know what it's inspired by. Like It's sort of like... It's, 19th, it, it's, it's like, one of those yeah, 80s action yeah, movies, Yeah, 18th, man. 19th century, like futuristic European garb. Um and he's got he's got like a he's got like a beard, like a good with a goatee, a mustache and goatee beard. His eye patch. And his eye patch, yeah. It actually looks pretty cool. Like, that'd be cool to, like, cosplay as that. And who are you? It's like, I'm, I'm Alexander Kerensky. It's like, no, you're not. You're not bald. It's like, no. Yes, I am. <laughs> Throw the picture down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, I think then, I'm not sure if, which house book it was. Uh, it was either, because I think Starly came out last of those books. Um, maybe, maybe it was a Karita house book that had, like, the first illustration of Alexander Kerensky. And that's when he's, he's bald. Um, that, that would become sort of the canonical version of Kerensky. Now, for those of you who are astute, you know, the name Alexander Kerensky was lifted from one of the famous generals of World War I and who would later play a part in um, the Russian Civil War, which would lead to the Bolshevik Revolution uh, in Russia. So Alexander Kerensky was this, you know, it was a name lifted. Whatever order it was in the Battletech universe was also lifted from an order that was issued, I think, back in World War One, And so they were lifting pretty heavily from history to get a lot of inspiration and fill out um, the meat of the universe. And so, um, yeah, so that's where, that's where the name Alexander Kerensky comes from, um, which also apparently is kind of wrong in a sense, because I think Russia is, their last names tend to be matronymic versus patronymic. So like, Kerensky said clearly the wrong last name, but no. Oh, yeah, I mean it's, it's whatever. The future. Whatever. Yeah. Everything's whatever. mixed up. We got sweet and ease, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, again, I, I just wonder, you know, back in the day for people who were playing, did it seem obvious that this was where it was where it was heading? Um because now I mean to us, yeah, I mean right now, yeah, it's like, yeah, where else would it have gone? I know. Now the only thing what, is what, what did they see? Yeah. The clans. I mean, well, they wouldn't even really be known as the clans, but what what were they thinking? Right. Like, what was it going to look like? Way? Was it going to be the mechs we got in, was it 2750? Yeah. That were doing, you know, the invasion? Was it... Yeah. Or was it the BS clan tech we got now? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, just the clans obviously ended up becoming something way different than I think many of us thought it would be. And a lot of that history is given to us via... Um, the Jade Falcon and, and Clan Wolf source yeah, books. Yeah, those were the actual first two source books that came out for the clans. Mm. And then we got, after that, Invading Clans. Actually, I think Invading Clans came out relatively late. Um, yeah. It, it was quite a while before we got that information. Um, and it may have even come out the same year that TRO 3055 came out. It is the only book that actually has the entry for Clan Smoke Jaguar in it. No. Yeah, well. Before, um, well, the two... What are the two field manuals yeah. for the clans? Because the Jaguars aren't in the Crusader. So yeah, the, the, so by timeline, because I think, yeah, the field manuals are dated after um, 
Operations Bulldog and Serpent. So, um, yeah. So that was a bit of a history lesson there on the, on the beginning of the clans, the sort of what looks to be them kind of putting down the ideas. Now, we do know that the writers would have summits, like they'd get together and they'd plan out products for a couple of years. And I'm wondering, you know, it, it seems somewhere between 85 and 86, they were really sort of fleshing out the backstory. Um, Battletech is not the first property to have uh, an ongoing meta plot for the game. Um, but I think it's one of the most successful ones. It is among the first, and it's certainly among the most successful that had an ongoing meta plot. I mean, it's been around for so long. Yeah. I just, it, when you look at it, even how it developed, it almost seems like they had a different idea, maybe, for the clans yeah. when they were coming up with it. Well, yeah, originally, I don't see why they wouldn't. Right, and originally they made it sound in the Battle Droids box set that there weren't any more Battle Mech factories. Like, this was it. Like, you what you have is what you've got and every time you lose a battle mech you're, you're permanently erasing a mech from the universe and obviously that changed that changed um i think at least as early as right at 3025 yeah it what really did it well 3025 you started seeing new mechs like the hatchet man mm -hmm. like you, you know factories were just coming into play but it really didn't hit until the memory core the hell memory core. core yeah because that's in that era before i think they did some kind of retcon later but it was towards the invasion when factories really started to kick up when we started getting... Um, well, that, the, that would change, it, too. Yeah. Because you see a lot of prototype weapons in... Well, it was the base Starly tech we got in 2750 yeah. and in uh, City Tech. So yeah. your ER Large Laser, your Ultra Auto Cannon 5, yeah. just like the bare minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, that's another thing, too, is sort of the way the... That's a, whole, that's a whole other podcast, too, is sort of the how things change in universe um, in terms of how it was presented and how, how, how bad the technological decline actually was and how bad it would be depending on where you were located. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean uh, clearly, you know, as they were kind of going, um, things were changing in universe in terms of how they were being thought about, how they were being presented, uh, where it was going to go. Um, well, in, in context, you can see like the clans were not rushed. Right. Right, they definitely were not rushed. It was something that they did think about. As much as the technology likes to imply it was rushed, yeah. it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's cool So to see that things were going somewhere. And that's why I wish... So, the, there's a, one of my favorite bands is King Crimson, and there's a, there's a pretty cool no, not novel um, uh, book written about the history of the band. And actually, they just put out a second edition, which is even bigger. Like, oh my god, it's like it's super... Thick. I don't even. I don't know when I'm going to read it, but um, it, it's neat talking to you know the the guy who wrote it. Obviously, talked to a lot of the band members, some of whom are, are no longer with us, and like previous band members. And uh, you know, oh, you know, we wrote this song, and this is where we came up with these different licks. And this is who came up with this part. And this is who came up with that part. Oh, I lifted this part from a, 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 a practice scale or, or set of arpeggios I would work on. And I just sort of changed the rhythm around, and that's how I got this lick. Oh, and you know, I we had this song. We we recycled parts from this other song we had like seven years ago that we never really recorded in the studio. We just play it live. Um, so we just took this idea and then plopped it into this song. Um, that's where we got this sort of chugging bass line. And so it's kind of cool to have these ideas. It's why I wish that we get sort of an insider's look. And I know that the the writers don't want to give up any information in terms of you know where the story is going because they want to make sure people people buy the future books right but i think you know academically it'd just be really interesting to see oh you know how'd you guys come up with this where'd you guys lift this idea you know who came up with with where this this was going to go and it'd just be neat to see oh yeah you know I, I took inspiration from this historical event or this is when we were starting to come up with the idea for the clans and then this is how we we sort of foreshadowed it and i think in terms of fiction um what i described you know is kind of how you could see this is when this idea was coming through and this is when they were sort of solidifying it and how they were sort of, you know, they were foreshadowing it. And, um, you know, Battletech having an ongoing meta plot both hurts it and helps it in ways that I think other games don't experience. Um, obviously it keeps us engaged. Um, you know, Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have an ongoing meta plot in the same way that, you know, Battletech, Battletech does. I mean, they got modules and stuff, but, the plot is really the scenario books that they put out. Right. 
right? Um, even even uh, Warhammer 40k, right? And that's not to knock 40k, but you know you've got this grim dark world where everything sucks, and everyone's miserable, and you've got sort of the histories for these these interstellar powers that explains or drives the motivations, but I never really got the, the impression there was much to describe what's going on. I know they have novels and stuff like that, but it's not like the Imperium of Man is going to fall apart and disappear. It's always going to be there because the Space Marines are the most popular, you know, yeah. thing. Um, whereas in Battletech, um, different powers can, can, you know, seriously be in jeopardy. And, I, you know, who knows what's going to end up happening after the after the ill clan all the all the free Russell hog republic fans out there rejoiced and then the you know the clans yeah. took them out yeah, took them yeah. out real quick <laughs> yeah yeah I'm like why would you take this from me yeah. i'm one of them it's okay <laughs> <laughs> so yeah yeah it's just it's and you know obviously you know the early 80s you know that that it's kind of funny to think you know how how fast those couple of years must have really gone by and there's a lot of material released um a lot of material, not just the number of books, but the number of words printed for the, those first, you know, six years of Battletech up to the clans. Um, but obviously, like, you couldn't stay in this perpetual state of um, technological degradation. And uh, I think it would have been nice to see... Well, because everything kind of played out in the novels, it would have been nice to see maybe the, the Fourth Succession War last longer, or to see more experimentation and more time set into the, the interregnum years between 28 and 39, yeah. or, you know, we, even 39 to, to, to 50. I mean, we just got the birth... I mean, I, I could reference the Rasahog Republic again. We just got a birth of that, you know, that nation. It would have been nice to see them at least last a couple decades. Yeah. Instead of the, what, how long they last? Like, five years? or Was it like that? Five or ten uh, years? Was, ah, uh, shoot. Was I mean, Razzle Hog was was Razzle Hog before or after? It was after thirty nine, right? Yeah, it was after, because they when I they had the Ronin Wars. Yeah, they had yeah. the Ronin Wars, and then they had the formation of the Republic. Yeah, I mean they've they've always been there since the beginning. I mean they were always referenced, even like back to the Razzle Hog Consortium in the Draconis Combine book. Yeah, but you know they didn't have time to shine as a faction as long as they probably could have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's, and I know that they've found ways to keep Razzlehog a player, you know whether it was, well, sort of merging with Comstar. Yeah, being there for Comstar, tech, and then now merging with Clan Ghost Bear. Right, right. So, uh, Razzlehog Dominion, and it, it, you know, giving the the like say like the Magnusons, um, you know a future, you know because it was the Magnusons were sort of the the new kind of house lords even though the, it seemed like their political system was different from a lot of the other houses but um by giving them future play in the universe by by giving ragnar magnuson a chance to become sakan of the ghost bears and then you know their own bloodline and everything which was which was good to see and i think that sort of plays into another topic so the evolution of clan culture um which is a whole other thing, and, and I think the, the pros and cons of it. But you sort of run, there's sort of this constraint of the ongoing meta plot and how it plays with the game system, and then wanting to do something adventurous and interesting and showing change and progression. And I'm sure this is the thing that the writers have to deal with, that they can't change things too much. Um, that's, that's, oh man, that's a whole lot to talk about. That's, that's like, that's like a, that'll have to be the next episode, because that's a whole. Yeah, sort of our part two into the clans how far do we get into this yeah i think we got into it quite a while um this is the thing was we probably should actually at the point where we get a decent microphone so we've been talking for about an hour man wow that, that, that just <laughs> zipped by that holy really crap zipped. yeah um so i think i think you know it's one of those things because we were talking about this earlier and and um you know one of the tricky things about BattleTech, much like comic books is that you'll have a comic book story arc right and kind of like you can never really kill the joker <laughs> You said you have to bring him back from the dead, or you got to keep him alive because Batman needs to be published ad infinitum because you can't ever not have a Batman comic book, right? Yeah. Um, that's why you can't just randomly kill the villains because there's always got to be future storylines. Um, you cannot kill Doctor Wily. What else is Mega Man going to do? Right, right, <laughs> right. Because even even like in Mega Man X, you know, 
They had Wiley's Sigma. Wiley's reference. Yeah, Wiley's still reference, and there, I think they missed an opportunity with Mega Man X because it could have brought back Doctor Wiley. It would have been a lot more interesting than seeing Sigma again oh and again. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> oh man, how many Cyber things, Wiley. Yeah, how many things we're gonna fucking talk about? Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a, um, a a rock and a hard place for the the writers because rock rock man Mega Man. Oh, oh man. Oh, man. Um, because in comic book story arcs, you know, they're they're always kind of laying the foundation for something else. You know, there's there's some sort of story seed or a cliffhanger at the end of like a four issue arc for the next two or three arcs, or maybe it'll show up four arcs later. Um, Grant Morrison in particular is very good at this when he would write stuff, and so so was Jeff Johns. Um, and it's tough, and you know, Battletech's done that with you know Comstar and the Clans and the Star League Defense Force. Um, and little little plot threads. I think I wish they do it more with other things. I wish they do it more with little side stories, um, you know, and conflicts like intra house conflicts rather than inter house conflicts. So the Fed Sons in particular have always been written as as being kind of the the white knights. And and Jordan Wiseman made mention that he tried not to do that, and it kind of didn't didn't happen that way um, for better or for worse. At least it wasn't perceived that way. And uh, What's what was interesting to me is that it, it seemed to play out better in the Free Worlds League and the Lear and Commonwealth to a certain extent. It was sort of referenced that way in the Federated Suns, sort of conflicts between the Hassocks of the Capellan March and the Sandovals of the Draconis March and then the Davian royal family. I think we needed to see more conflicts that way. And of course, we did see it with Michael Hassock Davian and Hans Davian. But that sort of wrapped itself in a neat little bow at the end of, of the Fourth Succession War. Yeah. Um, but you kind of always have to have these these plot threads, all these ideas going, and something's always to lead into something else. Um, and Battletech clearly did that. And uh, well, Battletech is also unique too in the fact that when they come up with these plot threads, not all of them go anywhere. Go because, somewhere. Because they're designed for us as plot hooks to use in our stories yeah. at the table. Battletech's very good at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it's one of the things is... I, I kind of I haven't felt that recently, and maybe that, that's my perspective. Um, the only one that comes to mind is coming up with the origins for uh, for Stone, Evan Stone. The Redevil Stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it, it, Battletech kind of needs it to be a bit of a sandbox. And um, they're definitely like in the... The handbook series that they did kind of had a lot of those plot hooks in there. The the Turning the Stars series they did, the PDFs with planets, had um, their own sort of plot hooks that played into how a time of war worked. Even the, uh, you know, MechWarrior First Edition and even the Mercenaries handbook. Because Mercenaries yeah. are really your bread and butter yeah, for every Battletech yeah. player. I think, I think one thing for me, though, that I felt the game lost with the coming of the clans was that it's been like this. It's sort of like event fatigue to kind of bring it back to comic books again is that you have these writers come up with these ideas for comics, but what ends up happening is that an event happens and everything that, that, that writers have been working on for the past year gets totally sidelined because every series has to tie into the event. It's a way for the comic book companies to maximize comic book sales. It's like, oh, I got to find out what happened with this. It's kind of one of the reasons why um, DC's Final Crisis was originally not well received at least initially was because they had all these different comic books that were supposed to be tie-ins but actually had you know major story ideas that made the core series make sense um with with battletech you had sort of room to play and then the clans came the clans were such an existential threat to the inner sphere that everything becomes inner sphere versus clan it turned into one verse one yeah and and so you didn't I mean, you could. I mean, you could do whatever you want at any point. You could you could tell any story you want, really, at any point. You could still tell a Succession Wars style story in the Dark Age. It doesn't really matter. But something about it just feels like you get to the clans. The clans kind of take everything. You get to the Fedcom Civil War. The Fedcom Civil War kind of takes up everything. You get to the Jihad. Jihad definitely takes up everything. Then you get to the dark age and the lack of the HP generators or the HP grid yeah. takes up everything. And then you get you get the whole shitstorm with the fall of the, um, the Republic of the sphere. 
And that takes up everything. And uh, granted, those are big, exciting events, and there's definitely a reason why they're there. And maybe it's just because we've been stuck in this dark age period for so long because we just haven't gotten to the end of it yet because the writers haven't put out those books. And there are reasons why they haven't put it out, you know, but it's just like we haven't gotten to it yet. And I just, just want it to fucking end <laughs> so we can get to the Give next Give us clan already. <laughs> yeah, so we can kind of get back to our sandbox experiment. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I kind of rambled there for a bit. Sorry, guys. No, that's all right. Yeah, that's pretty much what our show is. <laughs> Adam, Adam talking out of his ass. I wonder where else. Uh, I don't know. I guess maybe we can. All right. I mean, I, I think it's good for now. I mean, we we gotta we gotta kind of lay out the next episode because I think it's gonna be a lot more nitty gritty on the clans. Um, yeah, we, we might talk about. I mean, I think the, tech, the actual technology, the technology, and how it affected the board game experience. And I think what, what we've experienced um, in terms of the board game, I think what, what people at the time experienced, you know, and from what we've been told what it was like when you're playing a game and the clans came out and then you had these people that just want to play clan tech and how the game was balanced. I think the other thing is... Um, it might be worth taking a look at the clans the same way from like the meta perspective. Yeah. Maybe go as far back to see what homeworld clans are actually referenced in the first two clan books, the Wolf and Jade Falcon book. I want to say that how the, many of them were actually in there. I want to say they were in there. Cause I, you know, the other thing too is it's, I know, I know they're referenced in the fluff, yeah. but it'd be interesting to yeah. go back and see who's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, it's like when you look at sort of like references to the clans when they were coming, I mean, even, even in the Draconis combine, I'm sorry, the house Karita source book, and they're talking about the Minnesota tribe. Like clearly, I mean, this is, things were going somewhere. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I guess, I mean, to sum up where we're going to be going next episode, um, Zellbriggen is a lie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Zellbriggen's a lie. Which I think I think makes the clans more human and realistic. Um, no. Well, the, the, <laughs> well, the, the, sort of the lies we tell ourselves. It tames our, the, them. The tames, well, sort of like the lies we tell ourselves. To, it to it makes them more Nikolai Malthus. <laughs> Maybe. But yeah. Um, so yeah, stay tuned, guys. Stay tuned. We we promise we're, we're not going to make the clan sound terrible. Well. I, okay, I take my promise back. I'll try. 